Hi, welcome back to 19th and 20th Century Philosophy. I'm Matt Brown. Today we're talking about two of the most significant figures of 20th century philosophy, Martin Heidegger and Rudolf Carnap, and in particular, their encounter with each other circa 1929 to 1931. And I'm going to argue today that this encounter is a very different sort of thing than philosophers have tended to write about it. So here, in Carnap's 1931 article, The Elimination of Metaphysics Through the Logical Analysis of Language, Carnap quotes Heidegger's essay, What is Metaphysics?, as an example of, quote, metaphysical pseudo-statements that are, quote, based on a logical defect of language. And many commentators have looked at this uh, criticism of, of Carnap's and argued that Carnap sort of cherry-picks examples out of context, mocks Heidegger without really an effort at understanding what he's writing about. That basically what we have here is a, is a failure to communicate across the analytic and continental divide. I'm going to argue, actually, that this, this uh, impression is quite mistaken. Carnap had carefully studied Heidegger's work, and Carnap and Heidegger shared a significant philosophical background. In many ways, the two of them were undertaking different versions of the same basic philosophical project. And Carnap's choices in his criticism of Heidegger were actually very astute and pointed. Okay, but let's back up a little bit. Martin Heidegger, born 1889, died 1976, was a very influential German philosopher whose work is associated with uh, the, the traditions of phenomenology, existentialism, and hermeneutics. Though it's not quite right to classify him as any of those things without a lot of caveats. He was trained in neo-Kantian philosophy, and one of his mentors was Edmund Husserl, who we've, who we've read. Um, and Heidegger's early work actually is a lot like Husserl's in that it's focused on the nature of logic and, in our, and on arguments against psychologism. Uh, notably, in his early work, Heidegger wrote positively about Frege's contribution to logic at a time when the latter was not well appreciated, when Frege was not well appreciated. Now, when Husserl retired in 1928, Heidegger took over his position at the University of Freiburg. His ascension to that post, um, that high position, is no doubt a result in part of, of his publishing the year before, his magnum opus, Being in Time. Um, clearly his most influential work, although uh, it was incomplete when it was published and, and uh, he dropped the project thereafter. Now, one thing about Heidegger, which, which many of you have probably already heard, but which I cannot go without mentioning, I think, um, is that he was a card-carrying member of the Nazi party as of 1933. And in that same year, he became rector of his university, what in the United States we typically call a university president. He was the leader of the university. Now, I want to note that Heidegger um, never apologized for this part of his life. He never um, expressed remorse for supporting or joining the Nazi party. He did later on express a kind of uh, disagreement at a general level with uh, Hitler's regime and its approach but um, no kind of personal repentance. And while it's a matter of some controversy what the significance of this is uh, for um, Heidegger's philosophy, and it kind of goes beyond our scope today to get into that, um, I think the evidence actually is quite clear that there are some deep relations between Heidegger's philosophical views, especially his, his later views, although not exclusively, um, and his reasons for supporting the Nazis. So I think there is um, some significant connection there. Uh, and many Heidegger scholars agree with that and, and find those connections worth exploring. But before those dark times, just after his succeeding Husserl, um, but before the Nazis and the re rectorship and all that, um, in 1929, Heidegger participated in a famous disputation at a conference at Davos, Switzerland with one of the elder stars of German philosophy of the time, Ernst Cassirer. The topic of the meeting uh, of the whole conference was human nature, uh, and the focus of the disputation between Cassirer and, and Heidegger was um, the interpretation of, of Kant, of Kant's views on that topic, um, or really Kant, Kant's project in general. Um, Cassirer was there representing the Marburg, what's called the Marburg School of Neo-Kantianism, um, though, Kassir himself was kind of moving 
beyond Kant into developing his philosophy of symbolic forms into a kind of general philosophy of culture. Um, and Heidegger was there in a sense representing uh, what's called the Southwest school of neo-Kantianism, though he obviously was, was moving beyond Kant himself in very significant ways. And, and uh, Heidegger's version of Kant in this debate turns out to be a kind of um, proto-Heideggerian. Now, it's not, it's not hard to see the political resonance of their encounter. Um, Kassir was a, a kind of defender, not only politically, but philosophically, of the, liber of the liberal democratic Weimar Republic. Um, and Heidegger, as well, we've said, um, very much not a liberal democrat, um, rather a Nazi. In attendance at what we might call the rumble in the Swiss, Swiss Alps was one Rudolf Carnap. Carnap, two years uh, Heidegger's junior, born in 1891, um, died in 1970, was uh, another extremely influential German philosopher, one of the founders and uh, as significant members of the, the philosophical uh, movement known as logical positivism or logical empiricism. The logical empiricists combined ideas from classical empiricism with French positivism and with the new formal logic uh, that had been developed by Frege, Russell, and others, um, as well as formal techniques in the philosophy of language. Carnap himself was quite influenced by Frege, by Edmund Husserl, by Bertrand Russell, um, and by the neo-Kantian Bruno Bach. After Davos, where he found himself quite charmed by Heidegger, actually, um, uh, said he found him personally uh, attractive, Carnap spent some time studying Heidegger's philosophy in depth, uh, including a close study of uh, being in time and uh, leading a discussion group in Vienna in 1930 on, on Heidegger's ideas. Um, so there's a, quite a significant amount of work uh, there. So let's look at some of the key texts for their encounter. Martin Heidegger published his inaugural address to the University of Freiburg in 1929. What is metaphysics? Putatively concerns the old metaphysical question, why is there something rather than nothing? At least that's the example of a metaphysical question that Heidegger gives. Now notice, notably, um, Heidegger does not proceed in a traditional way to try to answer this question. Rather, he, he approaches it uh, in a quite different manner. He starts to unpack for us the various ways in which being um, and nothing are related to each other in the way we speak, the way that being and nothing are regarded by science, kind of positing nothing as a, as a sort of other or remainder outside of the scope of scientific knowledge, exploring and rejecting the connection of nothing and logical negation, the not of logic, arguing that um, the nothing is, is prior to logic. What Heidegger does in this essay is, is a kind of thorough undermining of the project of rationalist or traditional metaphysics, definitely different in approach, but kind of similar in conclusions to, to Kant, severely limiting the scope uh, of traditional metaphysics. Um, what is, after all, the subject matter of metaphysics for Heidegger at the end of the day? Nothing. Nothing is its subject matter. What unifies and grounds the sciences on uh, Heidegger's approach? Nothing. Nothing does. The analysis that Heidegger gives of nothing is not accomplished by some theoretical reason, um, building up a, an account of, of, of being and in relation to nothingness. Um, it's, uh, it, it's really accomplished through um, the exploration of, of a fundamental mood um, of uh, what Heidegger calls angst or anxiety, depending on your translation, uh, that somehow reveals nothingness or a kind of human finitude, um, reveals the nothingness that's always there in uh, sort of behind or in contrast to beings. Um, so it's, it's not really... Uh, rationalist metaphysics, it's this kind of exploration of a, of a mood or a feeling um, that uh, unpacks something that's also kind of there in our, in our way of speaking about these things. Two years later, Carnap publishes, uh, and I apologize here for my bad German pronunciation, Überwindung der Metaphysik der Logische Annelis der Sprach. I told you it would be bad. This is typically translated as the elimination of metaphysics through the logical analysis of language, thanks to Arthur Papp's 
um, uh, central translation of this of this essay. Um, however, it really probably should be translated as overcoming. Um, that's the way that that same word überwindung is uh, translated in. Um, uh, when it's used as it is often by Nietzsche or by Heidegger. You know, we can actually compare Heidegger's own project of the destruction of metaphysics or of the, of the destruction of the history of, of ontology here with Carnap's project, or with the fact that, that Heidegger uh, in other writings sort of equates metaphysics um, and nihilism or, or treats nihilism as the sort of result of the history of metaphysics. Indeed, Heidegger himself speaks of the overcoming of metaphysics, the Überwindung der Metaphysik, uh, in a later essay. So there's a lot of there's a, there's already a lot of um, shared space here, um, despite the way that it's set up. It, it's not really a case of Heidegger, the metaphysician, defending metaphysics and Carnap uh, attacking it. So, looking at Carnap's critique of Heidegger, I think we should ask. Is Heidegger really a metaphysician, and is it fair of Carnap to call him one? Well, I mean, the answer to the first question is muddy. Despite all the talk of overcoming and destruction, Heidegger, you know, he wants to, he wants to overcome traditional metaphysics, rationalist metaphysics, um, traditionalist philosophy, but also perhaps kind of preserve, preserve a sort of metaphysical philosophy grounded in mood and attitudes or stances um, and supported by the analysis of everyday language. Um, and so, you know, there's a sense in which it's not exactly metaphysics as it's been known, but there's some remainder which we might call metaphysics. So the fairness of Carnap's calling him a metaphysician kind of kind of gets at some of the details of their arguments and I think also points towards both their significant overlap in ideas as well as their central disagreements. So according to, to, to the philosopher Abe Stone, who's written on this, uh, their, their views on the overcoming of metaphysics, in the background of the debate between Carnap and Heidegger are several common starting points and argumentative moves. So first, Heidegger and Carnap both have a background in neo-Kantianism. Heidegger and Carnap are, were both heavily influenced by Husserl. The third, both Heidegger and Carnap accept the broadly Kantian project of overcoming or limiting metaphysics in order, on the one hand, to make room for freedom and morality, right? To limit reason, to make room for faith, as, as Kant himself puts it, while also, like Kant, Carnap and Heidegger want to retain what they think is right about traditional metaphysics, which is that it provides a kind of explanation for both the possibility of science and the unity of science. Also, both of these philosophers identify the same problem with Husserl. This is Abe Stone's argument, that the role of pure consciousness in Husserl's view, thought um, and the, the, the sort of his focus on logic as a kind of science of pure essences in his phenomenology brings traditional metaphysics uh, back in, in the back door, you might say. Um, and subsequently, there's, there's no room in Husserl's system for, for what um, these philosophers would regard as genuine human freedom. Furthermore, both Heidegger and Carnap make use of the analysis of language as the primary uh, sort of um, methodology for overcoming metaphysics. So it's along this background that Carnap chooses just those quotations that express Heidegger's main strategy uh, in order to criticize them. So the first part of the quote starts with a typical kind of um, statement drawn from, from everyday use. So Heidegger says, what is to be investigated is being only and nothing else, right? And that that's, makes sense. You know, science investigates being, nothing else, right? And what Heidegger asks us to do is to listen to what we're really saying, take responsibility for it, and then continue sort of following it out. So, okay, what is to be investigated by science? It's being only and nothing else. Well, what about this nothing, right? That sort of further uh, question is sort of drawn out of these earlier, more prosaic statements about being and nothing. It seems almost like a pun on the word, 
But like a pun, it's drawing our attention to how the language actually works in a way. In the next part of the quotation, Carnap puts on display Heidegger's argument that the nothing is prior to logic. This is an important move for Heidegger to make in order to escape uh, Husserl's holding up of logic as the science of all being in general, as a science of essences, um, and thus that move from logic back to metaphysics that's so problematic in Husserl on the, on the Kant, Carnap, Heidegger line. And while Carnap thinks that Heidegger's right to reject Husserl's views on the status and subject of logic, he thinks that Heidegger is wrong to, to think he can kind of look to something that's prior to any sort of logic. So there's a, there's a kind of reflex to the prior here, which, um, which Carnap thinks is, is also problematic. In the next bit of the quotation, he picks out, Carnap picks out the role of anxiety or angst in revealing the nothing for Heidegger. And this is important to Carnap's uh, sort of alternative proposal for, for what Heidegger should have been doing. And here is where Heidegger intentionally has pushed us into paradoxical language and the attempt to push our use of language kind of to its limits. This, this statement that nothing itself, nothings, seems like a sensible thing to say at one level, uh, maybe at a grammatical level, but um, actually, uh, you know, it, it's, it's paradoxical. It's, it's really pushing us to think, well, what does that mean, right? What we have here are two different orientations to how language is to be analyzed and used in philosophy. Heidegger says, listen to what our language really says in the way that we speak it in our everyday, casual, careless way, and then take responsibility for that, right? Really, you know, this is the kind of um, this is a kind of Kantian move, right? Give yourself the moral law, give yourself the rules of language, give yourself over to them freely, right? And take responsibility for for what they say, right? Really take it seriously. Carnap, on the other hand, you know, while he agrees with Heidegger that our ordinary language commits us to these strange ways of speaking, he says, well, so much the worse for ordinary language, right? He says we should use logic to remake language in the way that better suits our purposes. Here he, you know, he uh, emphasizes the, the, our freedom to give ourselves the law, and the law here are the conventions of the language we've chosen, right? And so that's a significant part of, of the conflict here. So before concluding, I want to come back to the mood of angst or anxiety and its role in revealing finitude or, or nothingness. And, and Carnap, in a way, gives Heidegger an out here. He tells us that metaphysical statements serve for the expression of the general attitude of a person towards life. He tells us that metaphysicians are musicians without musical ability. And I don't think that's meant to be an insult. I think what Carnap is objecting to here is not the general project of expressing these kinds of attitudes. What he objects to is, express, is sort of cloaking that ac activity in the intellectual garb of descriptive assertions um, uh, of metaphysics that in fact have no real cognitive meaning. That is, they're not the kind of statements that could be true or false. Um, what they do is they express a, an attitude or a feeling or a stance towards life. Um, and Carnap points out that, look, the purest forms of, of it, such expression are, are things like art and poetry and especially music. So what the metaphysician is trying to do um, is use the talent they have, right, for philosophy to do what the musician uh, actually accomplishes. And Heidegger, in his, in his later work, in a way seems to confirm Carnap's reading as he turns himself to poetry and increasingly to, to artistic modes of expression. Though Heidegger doesn't achieve anything quite like Nietzsche's Thus Spake Zarathustra, uh, a work that Carnap praises at the end of his essay, um, he does seem to move in something like this direction um, in, in, his, in his later part of his career. So, what do you think? Who got it right? Please let me know by, uh, by, by posting a message about it or um, 
uh, telling us in class. To be clear, I'm not myself trying to take sides in this, in this question about Carnap versus Heidegger. My point is simply that Carnap is here acting as an astute critic of a fellow philosopher with whom he agrees about much, about a topic that's key to both of their projects. Although, you know, um, these two German philosophers would become central to the analytic and continental traditions that would divide uh, the, the philosophy, especially in the English-speaking world, um, after World War II until near the end of the 20th century. Around 1930, they were part of a largely intact uh, philosophical scene, not divided, um, and they were closely in, in dialogue, at least for this brief time. Now, let me just end by saying that given Carnap's commitments to a, a kind of democratic socialism and Heidegger's own political views, which we've talked about, it's also difficult not to read certain political valences into the positions in this debate. But that's something that um, perhaps goes a little bit beyond uh, what, we're, what we have the scope to talk about here today. So um, thank you so much for, for uh, joining us. That's a complicated topic, uh, but well worth our exploration. I look forward to hearing what you think about it and talking to you next time. Does the nothing exist because the not, the negation exists? Or is it the other way around? Does negation and the not exist only because the nothing exists? The nothing is prior to the not and the negation. Anxiety reveals the nothing. The nothing itself, nothings. Would it be fair to say that that's big wizard energy on that, uh, on that quote?